Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details. It's The In Show, Australia's only show dedicated to innovation from Adelaide, Australia and across the globe. Hi, this is David Grice and Troy Sincock. This show is all about inspiration. You know, it's innovators and entrepreneurs, startups, people with great ideas, making them a reality. And we hear about the challenges they've faced along the way. You know, you don't have to go it alone, David. No, you don't. And that's what I love about uh, hearing these stories is that we're finding out not just about how they're building a community of people around them, but how they're actually... You know, overcoming the struggles and the hurdles and actually getting to get products to market. Yeah, exactly. Now, if you're uh, enjoying the in-show and want to keep listening, make sure you subscribe to our new feed in Apple Podcasts as well. To keep listening to the in-show, just re-subscribe to the in-show with the coloured logo. On the show, we've got Susan Rooney-Harding, a creative, qualitative data specialist and multimedia producer who founded the Story Catchers. And they're doing some incredible things around helping people discover the stories behind projects and programs around the world. Mm, and really using the power of people's most mobile devices to get those stories out there as well. I mean, we all have what we need to have our stories be heard. We certainly do. And uh, they're also equipping these communities with the skills. So they're actually teaching the the people how to do it. Mm -hmm. Uh, And therefore, being able to capture the stories of a project as it's actually unrolling. Right. And being able then to, uh, to use that as data to help show the results of how good the project was. And we've also got Scott Bucock. Now, remember, Troy, last year we had Scott on the show and he shot to fame on Shark Tank with his pegs with hooks called Hegs. Yeah, now, some people would have thought that was a ridiculous idea, but he really backed himself in and look at what has happened for him since. I know, it's a global business now and he's just opened an office in the USA and he's just expanding around the world. It's unbelievable. Now, you know what? He's got a new idea, Troy, and this one solves another issue in the laundry, but it's not only going to make things easier for you, it could save you money on doctor's bills as well. It's a pop-up laundry basket. Uh, you imagine you're getting all your washing out of the washing uh, machine, you put it in the basket, you're lifting it up, you're taking it outside, you're putting it down. And then I started Googling and I realised one of the largest back injury problems is actually lifting the washing basket because, you know, washing machines are 12 kilo and that's when Poppy was invented. More from Scott Bucock of Heggs Australia later on the in-show but now here's Claire with more in news including a story about an innovation in park benches which are helping to save the environment. What else have you got for us, Claire? Thanks, David and Troy. This week I'll be talking about a reef-saving robo-fish but first, a cure for blindness is one step closer after doctors in the UK successfully restored the eyesight of two patients. The researchers involved with the London Project to Cure Blindness used stem cell therapy to restore vision capabilities in a man in his late 80s and a woman in her 60s. Their eyesight has improved so much they're now able to read again and see faces. Both patients had an advanced type of age-related macular degeneration, otherwise known as AMD, caused by leaking blood vessels in their eyes. They're two of approximately 600 to 700,000 people just in the UK alone who have AMD. So how did the treatment work? The researchers inserted a large group of stem cells at the back of the eye on the damaged areas. The stem cells then successfully repaired the retina and restored vision in the two patients. The scientists hope this new treatment will become available in the next five years and that the treatment will become as routine as getting surgery for cataracts. Academics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology have set loose a robo-fish in Fiji's Rainbow Reef. Its name is Sophie and its goal is to save the many coral reefs found across the globe. The rubber cross-plastic fish is being used to track marine life. A diver can control the fish by using a specially modified Super Nintendo controller. The controller can stand the pressure of water because it has an outer shell filled with oil. Using this, the diver can change Sophie's speed, angle and trajectory. The fish can last 40 minutes in the water without needing to use a motor and can travel to depths of up to 18 metres. Inside Sophie is the motor, a sensor that detects buoyancy, a pump that moves the tail and a receiver which is wirelessly connected to the controller. If the connection is is lost between Sophie and the controller, the fish stops and stays in the same location. According to the researchers from MIT, other robot prototypes aren't as effective as Sophie because they have strong propulsion systems. This can cause turbulence in the water, which then scares the marine life away. Hopefully, Sophie will be able to provide reef-saving information to the experts. Still talking about saving the environment and air pollution reducing benches called city trees have been installed across Europe. 
they're capable of absorbing the same amount of pollution as 275 actual trees. The unique benches were created by Green City Solutions in Berlin and have been placed in cities such as Paris, Oslo, Amsterdam and London. The four metre high contraptions contain almost 1,700 tubs of moss. These pots of moss extract pollutants like dirt and soot from the air. The bacteria found in the moss then absorbs the polluted matter and the actual moss digests it. The city trees have inbuilt sensors that record data about the plants and their surroundings. Plus, the solar powered benches have Wi Fi as well as a rainwater tank, irrigation network, and a nutrient collector so that the contraption can regularly water itself. The creation can improve the quality of the air by reducing the amount of dangerous particles that can find their way into our lungs and bloodstream. It probably won't be too long until the city tree or something similar becomes a common sight in Australia as well. And that's what's in news this week. Thanks, Claire. Well, what do you think about that innovation, David? City trees, that I mean, that is extraordinary. We've grown up knowing that we've got to keep planting trees because of you know the benefits that there are in doing that. But these park benches are effectively taking the place of trees. I think, you know, we, we're really lucky because we live in a city of Adelaide that is is just full of trees and parkland surrounding it. And, you know, the whole design of our city was built around parks and green spaces and that sort of thing. But you look at some Asian countries where, you know, they're so densely populated that there is just no room and space for, for green space and trees. So something like this, I mean, 275 trees mm. in one park bench, unbelievable. It immediately makes me think of Los Angeles. You know, I haven't been there over the last couple of years. You know, there's that massive uh, smog cloud over the city. I mean, when you think of Los Angeles, you sort of think of sunshine and, you know, all the great things that happen over there. But then when you physically go there and see this looming cloud every day, which is clearly, you know, pollution or something like that, imagine if by installing these park benches, it could take that away. Now, I don't know if that's possible, but you would think that if it has the ability to absorb the same amount of pollution as 275 trees... You got to you whack one of those park benches on you know most blocks, and it's going to have some impact. It would have massive impact, and you know we we hear of the devastation that uh, that air pollution causes in in countries like China and and all of those sorts of things, and you know that's made you know global news, and I think it's something like ten thousand people a day are suffering the serious consequences of of air pollution related illnesses. So how many people's lives could be changed by the fact that we could throw a few park benches around some streets? And, uh, and just see the difference. I wonder whether what would come up for some big business is, though, we can create more pollution, we'll just install more benches. Now, there's something that's really interesting, isn't it? Because we don't want companies to, to lose their, I suppose, their future thinking around, you know, sustainability and becoming green. I think this is just going to add to what's already there and what what's, you know, the world is capable of achieving through, through beautiful green space. Mm, we're definitely living in exciting times. David Grice and Troy Sincock, we're talking innovation on The In Show. You can check us out at theinshow.online, Facebook, and follow The In Show on Twitter. Now, coming up, we'll find out more about participatory media and equipping communities with the skills to create digital content for multi-platform use. It's all about innovation. The In Show. Hi, I'm Lake Novakovic from Novatech, and you're with Troy and David on The In Show. It's David Grice and Troy Sincock. Soon we'll reveal Scott Bucock from Hegs Australia's new laundry innovation. And if you've missed an episode, make sure you subscribe to the In Show podcast on iTunes. Be sure to resubscribe to our new feed on Ozcast. That's the In Show with the coloured logo. The In Show. Susan Rooney Harding is a creative, qualitative data specialist and multimedia producer who founded The Story Catchers, Stories for Purpose, teaching participatory media and equipping communities with the skills to create digital content for multi platform use. So, Susan, tell us more about participatory media and why you're so passionate about this space. Okay, so participatory media is where I'm teaching the community how to actually create media and disseminate that media. Mm -hmm. And we use that in lots of different ways, actually. And one one of the ways that we use is, use it is in the monitoring and evaluation field. And so I actually teach people how to create media all on iDevices or, or smart devices, I should say. And the phone has this incredible power to be able to actually shoot, edit and publish all from the one device. And so it's like this whole media suite in a moment. Mm. So um, participatory media is where I'm teaching the community how to create media for a purpose, okay? And so those purposes may include engagement or they may include monitoring and evaluation data and stuff like that. When we're using it for uh, monitoring and evaluation data, 
the course needs to be carefully designed around a content plan because I'm asking people to be able to actually produce content that can be fed into reporting. And where that's actually really powerful is the people that are actually out there doing that stuff are the people that have already got relationships with the community. So say we're in, talking about Indigenous communities, mm-hmm. um, Number one, we've got we're really remote. It's really hard to get media producers out into remote areas. Mm. I do a lot of work remotely, and it takes me two days often to get into country. I'm not even out of this state. We, we live in a big country, you know. Mm, like, yeah. and one of those days is flying. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, it's sort of like big, big place. And so when you're talking about empowering people to be able to actually create their own media when they're out on country or when they're in community. Um, It's really powerful because they're the ones that have got the relationships. I can go into the community for sure, but I have to build that relationship with the community to be able to actually get those stories from them. So that's participatory media. Is it communities identifying their own need that then ask for your services or is it the other way around, that 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 you can see an opportunity to really connect people and have, you know, the stories that they've created be heard outside of their communities? Both. Mm. Both. So say, for instance, if we're using um, participatory media for a monitoring and evaluation process, it will be often the um, organisation that will identify that that's the need. Mm -hmm. And so I'll be sent in to help those communities to be able to create their own stories. But if it's just story for story's sake, again, it's often the organisations, I mean, that will actually identify that they want to have um, stories told of their communities and it's a lot more powerful to engage and empower the communities to be able to actually tell their own stories for a lot of reasons and it's probably cheaper too than Mm -hmm. sending in a video production team. Mm -hmm. So from a practical point of view how does this look so you know when you're talking about monitoring and evaluation data what do you do to help people? Okay so qualitative data is really story I mean it's just a fancy word for story, isn't it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, so traditionally we've been awesome at collecting quantitative data for years and years and years. Like the numbers have been king. But really when we're talking about a monitoring and evaluation process, it needs to be diverse. It needs to have both to be holistic. You know, our world doesn't operate in a monoculture, you know. It, it actually works in a biodiverse system. Mm. And it's the same with anything, like with monitoring and evaluation. We need to have a look at a bit of diversity. Like we can't really tell what's happening on the ground by the numbers. We can say, okay, so great. Um, A real example is I was working on a project up in the APY lands, which was a driver's licensing project. And it was having some phenomenal number results, you know, Um, So when they first went in there, the rate of people having licences in community was 17%. After 18 months, that had jumped up to around 30%, which is a huge success. Mm. However, we didn't know what those stories were behind those numbers. We knew that, yeah, that's great. It's having this really phenomenal effect. But what are the stories? And so I went out there to collect the stories to find out what the real effect was on the ground. And one of the stories that emerged, which, which is a really endearing story, a beautiful story and a very powerful story, is there's this young fella, 22-year-old, and he got his licence after <clears throat> a long time of not having his licence. He got his licence through this program and he, because he got his licence, he got a job. And this job was at the local school as an Aboriginal education worker. And because he had this job as... The, and his licence, he actually thought, well, you know, to get the young fellas at school, perhaps I'll create a program, an incentive program, that if they come to school every single day, I'll um, take them out hunting on Fridays, on Friday nights. So, you know, like from him going and getting his licence, he got a job and he's now he's now instigated a cultural program within the school and all of a sudden, the int- attendance rate of the school of these young fellas went up 100%. Wow. So how would we know those stories, right. you know? Mm. Really powerful stuff, mm-hmm. all from getting a licence. So we don't know those stories unless we go out there and find out what those stories are and then we can actually do more of what's working or do less of 
what's not working. Mm. And so what we do is I go out, I capture all of the qualitative data and we've got a really, we use a process called most significant change, which is not a new innovative monitoring and evaluation tool. Mm. However, the way we're doing it is, and so what we um, do is we do it on video. And why we do it on videos, um, because we do participatory forums. Mm -hmm. And those, so I come back, I go out into country or I go out into the communities, I collect all the qualitative data or the stories, and then I bring them back and I edit them up into documentaries. And I've usually got about six different documentaries. I then actually go with my monitoring and evaluation specialist and we go back into the communities and we do participatory forums using the documentaries. So... The people's in the community and the managers and the CEOs are all part of this participatory forum of unpacking the stories, finding out what the enablers are, what the barriers are. And why video is so important is, you know, particularly when you're talking about minority groups, often, I mean, I know up in the lands, English is their fifth language. Mm, you know, right. Like having it on video and can be able to connect to a face makes it real, you know. Mm. And so then my monitoring and evaluation specialist will do all of the unpacking. She'll write a written report. She will give me that written report and I will then actually make a full documentary from that written report. So I've totally visualised a report mm -hmm. and made a documentary out of it. Those videos are so powerful because who really is going to read a 50 to 100-page mm -hmm. report? Yeah, Yeah, you're right. However, who's going to watch an eight-minute video telling you all about what's in the report? <laughs> it's changing times. And I've got to say, you are blowing my mind, Susan, mainly because you know, I've worked in radio for 26 years. And when you take a look at the decisions made in radio, it's all about numbers. It's mm. this percent, that percent. And, you know, as a kid, I remember working for um, the most popular radio station in the city at the time. And I remember being, you know, the, the junior employee and going, I get that that's that we're number one, but we're not that good. Like it feels like we're complacent, that we're routine, that we're doing traditional things. We're not uh, doing anything to maintain our popularity because by doing the same thing, you know, eventually someone is going to innovate around us and we're just going to, you know, fall from grace. Um, what you've just put into words is something that would absolutely benefit, you know, the media industry. I mean, after all, isn't that supposed to be about communication? And story. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So do you see, uh, you know, the, the work that you're doing with the remote communities yeah. in Australia, do you see other areas where there could be enormous benefit? Uh, definitely. So in the um, development areas, I mean, obviously that is in a development area anyway, but in the development areas, anything that's a people program, mm -hmm. really, um, anything that has people in the program, this is, uh, uh, you know, great for. Mm. So really, how many programs have people involved? Yes, Every, every yeah. program, yeah, and, and lots of government funding and, and government agencies that are that are doing things in different industries as well. I mean, this would be hugely valuable mm. because I know the reporting mechanisms that are in place for a, an organisation to actually report back to the government about what has happened. Um, you know, this this would be absolutely powerful for that. Yeah, definitely. And and as I was um, saying before, um, the monitoring and evaluation side is often an afterthought. It's an afterthought of a program and so it's sort of, you know, put on to the end of it. However, if it's actually thought about from the beginning, you can actually look at this from lots of different angles and actually pull on lots of different budget streams because it's not only an M&E tool, it's a PR tool, it's a communications tool, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a tool to be able to use in so many ways. It's not just... A report for reporting purposes. Oh, we've got to mm. get this report out because we've we've got this amount of money mm. to be able to you know do this program. However, you can use it for so much more than just a report. Yeah. Mm. And how did you get into this? Is is this something that you sort of you know woke up one morning and thought that'd be a great opportunity, or or is there been a big history to get you here? Oh, there is a bit of a history actually. I used to be a nurse, strangely enough, and people go, oh my God, nursing, documentary filmmaking to monitoring and evaluation sort of stuff. But actually nursing was crucial to do what I do 
you know, there's so many skills, those soft skills that I learned in nursing that I would have never learned anywhere, you know, and those things are like earning people's trust really quickly, which mm. is just crucial in, mm. in documentary filmmaking and, you know, asking the really challenging questions often in difficult situations. And my ability to read body language is just extraordinary after being a high dependency nurse for some time. Mm. So, you know, all of these skills I would have never learned anywhere else. And to be able to actually bring those into my practice, um, to be able to get that authentic story from people um, was really crucial. I did used to work for, um, well, the ABC actually a long time ago. And so I, when I left the ABC, I knew that a story was pivotal to where I wanted to go in my life. And I wanted it to be central to where and who I was because story was just so powerful for so many things. And so when I um, started my business, I realised that actually I just don't want to tell story for story's sake. I want to be able to tell story for a purpose. And so that's where I sort of started creating this methodology of being able to actually use it to change programs and change policy and, and you know, hopefully too change legislation mm-hmm. because it is native to us. It is the way that we learn. It's the way that we grow. It's the way that we change our societies is through story. Mm-hmm. So to be able to use that in a really um, purposeful way and a multi-dimensional way as well, actually, to be able to use it for so many different things. I know that my clients use the stories that I create for lots of different things, not just for a reporting purpose. Yeah. Mm. Why are you so passionate about having that kind of impact? I have a huge social justice bone in my body Mm. and it's actually the core of who I am and it drives everything that I do. And if there is a way that we can make our world more just, I'll be there doing it. Mm. But I'll be making sure that I'm doing it with a purpose, you know, Mm -hmm. like I'm not just going to go and protest something if I can't physically change it, you know. So this is a way that I can make an impact Mm. and hopefully change the way that we're doing things. And was there a moment when you realised that? When did you get really connected to that, who you were? You know, really that's an ongoing thing for me, uh, getting connected to who I, who I really am. Um, but I think that I reckon it was, you know, when I decided to leave nursing because, you know, when I was nursing, I, whilst I really loved looking after people and all of that sort of stuff, I'm a really creative being. And to be able to actually go to work and do what my creativity was really what I wanted to do. And nursing wasn't that. There's nothing mm. creative about nursing. It's very textbook. It's very scientific. It's mm. very, you know, which actually is really a beautiful mix between the two. I know that, I mean, I'm doing this course at the moment called Human Centred Design. And one of the things that IDEO Acumen look for is for this uh, diverse sort of um, skill set of being this. And I've got that. I've got this real scientific background with a really artistic, creative bent. And Mm. marrying the two together has, um, it's been natural to me. But now I realise that actually, you know, all of that scientific stuff is very methodical and it makes me uh, think about how I'm doing stuff. And that creative urge is this, the dynamic sort of side of stuff that brings everything together. So, yeah, when I left nursing and made that decision to leave nursing, I really had to make that decision to, I made that decision to, um, to find what it was that made my heart tick because, you know, we're here once, that's it. It's mm. not a dress rehearsal. Mm. I'm not going to get to the end and go, whoa, I wish I did that. Mm. So really I wanted to find that thing that made my heart tick because, uh, you know, I, I, I also wanted to live a life of purpose. Mm. It's a, it's a really empowering place to be when you when you pulling everything that you've learnt through your your life into what you do as a as a job and and I mean I've been very fortunate in my life to be have done that pretty much my entire career because every time I changed tact or changed direction was because of what had happened before and I learnt from that and I was able to build on that but what I didn't realise until recently was that. What I've done in the process of that is helped a lot of people along the way. And what you're doing is super important just in terms of the remote and regional communities and all of the other work you're doing. Those stories, there, there must be so many powerful stories that you have already experienced with this with this project. But I guess what I was trying to get to is how important for you is waking up in the morning and being able to just get out of bed and be happy to go to work? 
Oh, it's not work to me. Yeah. Mm. It's just not work. It's, it's, I do this. I'll do this to the day I die. I mean, I'm so incredibly privileged that I'm doing what I'm passionate about. Mm. And I totally created it that way. Mm. As I said before, it's not, I, I don't want to get to the end and go, wow, I wish I did, I did what I wanted to do in my life, you know. I did that for 10 years. Yeah. I woke up and went to work and didn't love what I was doing. Mm. That was enough. 10 years was enough, you know, mm. like. Today I wake up and it's not a it's not work. It's just not work. I, I, there's nothing about it that's work. It's just a pure joy to listen to people and um, hear their stories and give them that platform to be able to share. You know, a part of who they are. And what an honor! What mm-hmm. a complete honor! I have of being able to hear those stories. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm sure you have plenty of stories to relate yourself, but is there anything that comes up for you in regards to your work and really being knocked back by a story or something that really changed the way you looked at things? What you must be hearing out of you know their worlds must just be mind-boggling at times. Well, it's extraordinary. I mean, we have um, the oldest living culture sitting in this place that we are so privileged to call home being Australia every single one of those people blows me away yeah you know like there's not I I feel so honored and so privileged to sit next to them and hear them and give them the platform that they deserve to be able to be heard you Mm. know and Mm. and to be um in integrity with their story when I edit it and things like that, and to not actually um, put my bent on it. This is their story. This is and keep that authenticity uh, is really crucial to my practice, and it's really crucial to the monitoring and evaluation process as well. Because mm. um, you know that authentic story is. So there's not one story. It's just this conglomerate of stories. It's just the whole story, mm. the whole story of our of our of our first people mm. on this um on this beautiful country of ours yeah so i i just feel completely honored and it's obviously not just for indigenous people either um anybody's story to me is is a complete honor to hear great now tell me you're going to sri lanka this sounds really exciting for the fourth world conference for women's studies what's that all about and what are you doing well i'm talking about my monitoring and evaluation methodology which mm-hmm. i've been talking about with you today mm. And, um, yeah, I just saw it as an opportunity to be able to actually get this methodology. Actually, my goal this year was to get this uh, methodology globally. So I th- hopefully within that conference we'll see a lot of people. There's a lot of aid companies over there. There's a lot of UN, there's UN, UN women. There's the gender equality issues in Sri Lanka are huge. Um, in fact, a lot of our aid dollar is spent on um, gender equality issues or programs, I should say. And so it would be a really interesting project to be a part of Mm -hmm. and to be able to share my methodology with the other people. And what sort of impact do you want to have globally? Like how do you see this working? Oh, well, I I can see this uh, working for all of those programs at the UN and DFAT and, you know, USAID and Mm -hmm. um, Red Cross and all of those programs that have people in the middle. So, yeah, I do want to actually get this methodology out to those people. And the reason why I want to do that is because we can find out how we can do this better, you know, how we can be with each other better Mm. and do programs better and do programs with people instead of for people. That was Susan Rooney Harding from The Story Catchers. It's David Grice and Troy Sincock on the in show. Next, we'll find out what Shark Tank sensation Scott Bucock is up to next and how you can help him get his next innovation off the ground. Download the Phoner app before you head to your next event. Find people easier, market yourself better, and get connected using Phoner. That's spelled P F O N R. Phoner. Available in the App Store now. Hi, I'm Chester Osborne from Derenberg, and you're listening to The In Show. Well, David, you'd remember last time we spoke to Scott Bucock from Hegs Australia. Oh, absolutely. I mean, what an inspiring guy. The, the story behind, you know, where he started and, and how Hegs actually came into existence, just 
nothing short of amazing. And he's so generous with everything that he's learned too. You know, he's always you know really happy to to share the things that he's had to overcome as part of his business to make things easier for others. Mm, and I like the way he's now opening his uh, his doors for other innovators to come to him to for him to assist them to get to global markets. Exactly. Well, you know, now he's got another innovation to reveal to us. Scott, we all know about Hegs and how you've sort of taken over the world with that with stockers from the US to Europe. And now you've got a new project. Well, tell us about that. Yeah, the new innovation, uh, we've nicknamed it Poppy. Uh, it's, a, it's a pop-up laundry basket uh, and it's simply come out of necessity, same as the Heg, to be honest. Um, uh, hanging out your washing, you, you imagine getting all your washing out of the washing uh, machine, you put it in the basket, you're lifting it up, you're taking it outside, you're putting it down, and then you're up and down to the line putting your washing out. So that's when I realised, wait a second, you've had, there must be a better way to get it from the ground to hip height, so you can just take your washing out and you don't have that bending over. And then I started Googling and I realised one of the largest back injury problems is actually lifting the washing basket, because, you know, washing machines are 12 kilo, some of them are 12 kilo, so it's lifting 12 kilograms, you know, 20, 30, 40 metres out to your washing line, mm-hmm. and that's when Poppy was invented. This is absolutely extraordinary that, you know, your previous experience had nothing to do with people's laundries at all. You've discovered pegs and now you're entirely revolutionising that home in the house. Yeah, it is. It's, uh, I like to say laundries are the new kitchen. Everyone used to spend their money in kitchens and now they're spending their money in laundries. They just want to make them better and better. And, uh, and, and it's one of those things that every time you use something, you go, there must be a better way. And there usually is. Perhaps just describe to us what Poppy is. Or what it looks like. Sure. Actually, the innovation came about when I was traveling. And I, you know, your luggage, when you have the little pop-up, you press the button and, and it extends up. And I went, oh, that's not a bad little idea. And went home and thought, wow, if we could actually use that technology and integrate a laundry basket with a pop-up system, then that would solve it. And that's when I realized if you design it around and make it uh, good looking, for want of a better word, you press the buttons, you lift it up and it locks in. And there you go. You're at uh, waist height and you can put your washing out. And that's where it all started from the, the humble luggage, the humble uh, suitcase. And, you know, what a, a great thing too, because it means that uh, everyone gets the opportunity to use Poppy. Like, you know, if I, I'm tall, I'm about six foot four, there are things for me that are like super difficult and, you know, and it really does have impact in your day-to-day life. But knowing that there is a, a product which would be flexible enough for me to use, then my girlfriend can use it in a different way. Do you see that being sort of commonplace in the world of innovation, you know, looking at things that can be pivoted in such a way that the application exists for all sorts of people in all environments? Well, it does. And if I ask you now, um, you know, if you had a basket where you could wash your dog, you could uh, have some beers on the, on the veranda, uh, if there's a rolling system you could just roll out, your answer probably is no. So the extension of Poppy will be a solid basket that you can just swap it out with your laundry basket and put your solid basket in. So it's actually the trolley system is the innovation. The trolley system is the mechanism. And really one of the most important things for me was for the elderly. You know, a lot of mums, dads, the elder, being able to wheel that, pull your washing out, wheel it outside with ease, lift it down the curb going outside the door, across the grass, across the pavement. Uh, you know, it's going to help a lot and it'll stop tripping and back injuries and the whole lot. What's been happening for Heggs actually in the in the meantime? Obviously, we we spoke to you some months ago. Now you've had a massive journey since. So where, where have you been at? Yeah, this is exciting for Heggs. They originally started as the Heggs Peg, uh, and Heggs has elevated itself to, I guess, uh, a, a vendor that helps other entrepreneurs and uh, innovators bring their product to market. And Poppy's another, obviously, an invention internally. But we're working with a couple of electricians here in South Australia that invented another product that will hit the shelves in the next three or four months. Uh, we're working with older ladies and younger men and a whole range that have an idea and just don't know how to bring that product to market. So I guess the Heggs brand has become a, a little bit of a vision for people going, wow, if he can bring a peg with a hook to market, we must be able to bring our products to market. And usually they can, but it's all about how to sell it, how to make it and how to distribute it. And is your brand uh, just focused on things in and around the home? It is at the moment. Uh, for now, we're concentrating on the laundry section. Uh, then we'll move it into the kitchen section and the garden. Uh, it's it's funny, the new invention that's coming out, which is primarily laundry, with a little bit of innovation, and I can't wait to talk about it at some point soon, it actually can be used in sheds and gardens and laundries and pool fencing and a whole range. So, you know, we're, we're always working towards, is it just for laundry or is it actually multi-purpose in some way, shape or form? Do you sleep at night? I do. I sleep very well. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's just like, 
you inspire me every time we, we talk because just hearing how you're thinking all the time about, you know, it's not just about the laundry, but it's about all the other applications. How do you sort of stay in that mindset? Is that something that's, that you have to really consciously work on or is this just a natural thing that happens for you as you're thinking about your products and services? Yeah, I, I, years ago, I tried to think why I do what I do. And I realized it wasn't just myself, but everyone is, is I have a little bit of a, bit of a cycle um, and it's called winning, which is why idea, network, no man's land, innovate, now the how and go for it. That's a very quick thing. But the big part of it in the middle is the two ends, network and no man's land. Network is where you actually get all the facts and figures and do your Googling and speak to your friends and speak to anyone you know on bringing that product or that idea to market. And then you move into no man's land, and that's where everyone says, no, that's been number four. No, that's uh, never a good idea. No, that's never going to work. And if you can get through no man's land from one trench to the other, that's when you move into the innovational stage. So I always think to myself, where am I in that cycle? Am I in the network stage, the no man's land stage, or into the innovation stage? As long as I know where I am, I can get through it. Mm. And what connects you to all this, um, Scott? Like, what is the motivation? Is it the thrill of you know coming up with the idea? Is it getting it to market? Is it helping people? I think there's two main focuses. One is physically seeing the product in your hand. That's the exciting part. I never forget when that uh, first HEG arrived after being prototyped and was in your hot little hands. Uh, the second one is obviously seeing the product on shelf. To see it, uh, we just rolled out a product and it hit the major supermarkets again last week. And to see the new bag design, the new look, the new feel, the new brand sitting on shelf again, uh, there's something that just is exciting about that. And I have a, I have three containers now of uh, hi- historical innovation, and they're all involved in HEG. So we've had bags and HEGs and uh, posters and, you know, so keep it. If you ever do any prototyping or any innovation or sketches or drawings, Keep them because I guarantee you years down the track, you're going to want to look back and think where it all started. So, Scott, remind us how you actually came to finance HEGS. Financing is always a difficult part and everyone thinks you have to have $50,000 to begin with. You don't. Firstly, start with just a prototype. So walk down to your local university and say, hey, I have an idea. Um, Could I just get a 3D printed prototype? spend the $30, $50, and then next time make it better and better. And then you're going to have to do a website and then you're going to have to do a marketing. So I guess for me, it was spending little bits at a time Mm -hmm. and then eventually going, hey, I've got a product now, I've got a business now, and then I went out to investment. And of course, that was involving Shark Tank at that point, saying, okay, we're now into the hundreds of thousands, we need someone to back it. But you can only get those hundreds of thousands or you can only get financing when they believe in you or they believe in your product. So move through the steps and then eventually you'll get there. Mm. Now, uh, people, not everyone has access to Shark Tank. And in fact, when it comes to this new product, Poppy, you're doing a Kickstarter campaign. That would be something that a lot of you know startups and entrepreneurs and innovators, that would be often their first step, right? It would, correct. Uh, it's funny. Everyone looks at the Heggs brand and, and to be honest, everyone thinks we're rolling in cash, which is not true. Uh, so when it comes to uh, an object like Poppy, it's going to cost $100,000 for the tool. And a tool can sit somewhere about 1.3 metres high by 1.3 metres wide. Imagine a big, solid piece of steel, and you've got to cut that in half, and then you have to make poppy in it. So that costs hundred grand. So financing now is simply, no, we don't have that cash sitting in the bank. So you've got to go out and think of new ways to, one, market the product, to, two, see if people actually want it. Because at the end of the day, if they don't want it, why build it? And then the third one is to finance it. Uh, So we're trying something new. We're trying something different. And Kickstarter is a very well-recognized crowdfunding source in America and uh, and Australia. Actually, it launched about a year ago. So we're going to try that platform and hope people uh, support Poppy. And that's the value of a platform like that, isn't it? Because it does, it, sh- it shows you where your customers are and, and the demand for it. And then at the same time, it's actually allowing you to build the finance to, to get what you need done. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's quite interesting when we ser- press launch, uh, we had a little bet. Uh, we said, who's the first person to purchase it and where? And the first person to purchase a poppy was actually in New York. The second person was in Germany. So you got to watch people around the world believing in a in a product or believing in a in a campaign. Uh, so it, and now obviously it's all about Australia and, and focusing on our sales in Australia. So just going back to the investment side of things, how have you found working with investors? Is it been something that's restricted you or has it opened you? 
There's two sets of investors. There's uh, the shareholders who want equity in your company, and there's investors that want to be paid a return. They're really the only two things. Uh, So you've got to really think, do you want to give away part of your company and why? Or do you just want money and you're happy to pay interest back and eventually they go away and you get to keep that percentage? We have 50-50 in HEGS, we have shareholders, and we have investors. I don't think we'll ever, when I first started, someone said to me, he goes, when you get your next investment, it won't be your last investment. And when we've got our next investment, it won't be our last investment. And I've learned that's actually very true because growth, you need to grow and you need money to grow. So the old analogy, cash is king, is bang on. I can only imagine that sometimes investors could potentially be pulling you back depending on the amount of say or sway they have with what you're doing. Um, how have you found that process? Is it, is it been something that's easy or is it just, you know, that constant, I've got to work on my relationships with my investors and, you know, it's that constant grind to make sure that everyone's happy? Yeah, you probably won't get an investor unless, one, they like you or, two, they're going to get a return. They're the two things that people focus on. Quite often, investors invest because they have cash spare. So they've either got to be one of those two things. I work on my relationships a lot. Because there are investors today for a small amount. If you turn it around and become successful, then they'll invest with you again and again. So don't just take their money, run, and then forget about them and go, oh, here's your money back. They actually will back you and continue to back you business after business, product after product, as long as you are the nice person, you do the right thing, you work hard, and you, uh, and you obviously give their money back at some point in time. And the same would be said for your customers as well, wouldn't it? It's not just a, a transaction, people buy some stuff and then that's it. I get the sense that, you know, you approach things in a really similar way. How important is, you know, really telling your story and having people invested in that rather than just the product itself? Yeah, the customers, um, if you look at a lot of triangles, uh, business models, uh, the customers are actually the end sell. They go, oh, we build the product, we come up with the idea, we do this, and then we sell it to customers. We reverse that completely. When these innovators and entrepreneurs walk in our office, we go, well, let's talk to the customer first. Do they actually want it? Why would they want it? And I call it the visual, the verbal, and the viral. My three Vs, is it visually good, is it verbally good, and is it virally good? So we concentrate on that first. The building of the product, the, the development, the, uh, the, all that end stuff is really quite low on the, uh, on the agenda. It's really primarily important to make sure that that product or the idea that you have can be sold. So customers are absolutely number one. It's interesting that you say that because often innovators think about their product before they think about the customers. And and I feel like um, often when we're hearing stories about what people are creating, it is just very much about the product rather than the user. And having that focus towards the user is is absolutely sensational. I mean, working with um, music and technology, for example, you know, a lot of people just say, well, here's a, here's a problem to solve the problem for a musician. Yeah. In fact, they don't think about how to solve a problem for the customer who's purchasing what the musician is creating. So it's really cool to, to sort of hear that, you know, you, you've got that focus and flipping that around. Was that something that you learnt or was it something that just sort of automatically was natural to you as, a, as an innovator and inventor? No, I, I think I learned is definitely a primary. It is not my background. Manufacturing was never my background and certainly selling at a mass platform or volume wasn't my background. And it's funny because even four years later in Heg's world, we get people come in and they go, oh, I've got this great product and I've designed this, this awesome box and, and here it is. It's this big and this long. And I go, wait a second, there's two sets of customers. There's the customer that buys the product and then there's the buyer that puts it on the shelf for the customer to buy the product. So I would look at it and go, "Uh uh-oh, we have a problem. It's too long. It's too tall. You're shipping too much air. It's too fat. It doesn't fit on a clip strip. The shelf is only 60 centimetres deep. So there's the buyer really that that is primarily the first person that you've got to talk to to say, does it fit? Is it the right size? Is it the right colour? Does it hang? And then, of course, you go, when somebody's walking past, are you going to stop them in their tracks and go, I want one of them? So there's two sets of customers, and a lot of people don't realise that. They come in with a product finished, and now I go, hey, we can't sell that. It's the wrong size. Mm, That's really interesting. Mm. I'm really interested in in your journey, you you know, in terms of you said that you had no experience in manufacturing and and especially just on a local level, let alone the fact that you now are at the helm of a global company. What have you put in place to help you sort of get to the level of, of being a global CEO as opposed to just somebody who's making something locally? Yeah, it's a, it's a really big question uh, and learning it, uh, exporting is a minefield both ex- 
exporting out of Australia or exporting into Australia. And I go overseas. I've just come back from Chicago and meeting a lot of people going, oh, we're thinking of exporting. And I go, wait a second. They're in America exporting to Australia. So you forget that everyone's doing the same thing as we are. So to solve that problem, we've set up HEGS USA. So we have an office in USA now um, in Florida. Uh, we're setting up HEGS UK. So we've just we've learnt very quickly that buyers or, or consumers and companies want to purchase from the country of choice. Now, that doesn't mean you don't make it here in Australia or make it in the country of choice. It just means you give, it gives you that direct communication in time frame. Don't forget, we're at 17 hours behind America. So, you know, I, I can only work so many hours in a day. So we set up teams around the world to be able to do that. I really like how thoughtful you've been about, um, you know, moving into other countries because often the conversation is about, um, you know, perhaps being a Western country and then trying to export your products to a Eastern country. And so there is the language barrier. So although these countries, you know, that you're working in often, are, you know, English speaking customers and, you know, and buyers and that kind of thing, there are the nuances in the, in the different countries. What sort of things have you had to get around? Like what expertise didn't you have? Well, a great example is us thinking we know everything. And on our very first bag, uh, we put bras and knickers on the front of the bag and then realized that we couldn't export them into the UAE. Mm. You just mm. can't have that. And we went, oh my God, we didn't even think about that. So that is a really visual example of not asking what you're allowed to bring into a country. Mm. Uh, but now we're actually rolling out in Germany. Uh, we've got TV shopping in uh, Korea and uh, France and Belgium, Russia. So we're, we're rolling out in language as well. But we've learned, hey, just, just bring it back a little, find out what you're allowed to um, market over there, find out what you're allowed to promote over there. And again, ask lots of questions. It all sounds really simple about this whole exporting to other countries, but I'm sure there's a lot of hurdles that you have to jump through, especially with the import-export duties and, and different things like that. What have you found to be the most significant hurdle when you're exporting? What I found to be the most significant hurdle um, in exporting is logistics. Just the physical moving a product from A to B and knowing what the duties are going into those countries. I don't think there's a definite answer on any of it because I'll give you an example. If we're shipping a container of eggs to America, where in America? Is it California, which is 20-odd days to get there, or is it Tampa, where you're going to go through the, the Panama Canal, which is 45 days? So sending a container to California compared to Tampa, same country, could be an extra $2,000. So then you have to divide that $2,000 divided by every bag within the container. So you've really got to do a lot of formulation and division of what it actually costs you per bag, per item. Um, poppies, for example, will fit about 700 of them in a 40-foot container. Hegs, we fit 48,000 of them in a container, a 40-foot container. So it's a completely different metric. Yeah. So you've always got to think about uh, where you're sending it and how much you're sending it for and try to build that price in. When you're setting up your offices abroad, what do you need? Like, what's the starting point? Does it just start with one guy who's connected that, that knows the plan, or is there a certain you know, level of expertise you need in a, a small team that you start with? You need an address. You need a phone number. You need a contact. They're the three primary. I don't care whether you just go to a virtual office or, or a warehouse or whatever it is. You need some sort of point of contact. We did that to begin with, and it's funny. I was there last week going, right, now we're about to launch into HSN and a Home Depot and different places. We actually have to have 20 pallets sitting there. So now we've gone from a virtual office to a bigger office, a sit-down office, to now a little warehouse. So we took it in stages too. We didn't just go, right, we're going to send 40-foot container into America. We need a big office. We need a big warehouse. You just have to be – it's based around money, really. What can you afford at the time? Um, so don't think – everyone says, oh, I've got three offices in America. Well, that's great, but what does that mean? It really doesn't mean anything unless you're actually selling the items on the other end. Is having a global office actually meant that you've had to seek more investment to do that, or is that something you've been able to self-finance through the, the journey? No, we're, we're in phase three of investment. We're actually currently in it right now. Uh, we've been through the, the Shark Tank phase. We went through the second investment phase, and now we're into our third investment phase. Uh, simply because of our growth, we just secured another 1,100 stores in Australia. Uh, we're about to secure 4,000 in America. Uh, we've just the uh, Aldi UK, Ireland and Scotland, another uh, couple of hundred thousand bags and uh, Germany. So we're into phase three. And, you know, I've resigned to the fact there will be a phase four. 
there just always will be. And you never know, eventually we may see Heggs sitting there as uh, an on-the-stock market item. You never know. Let's hope so. That's the goal. So for from uh, for Poppy's um, crowdfunding campaign, what do you what do you need people to do? Yeah, we need them to jump on Kickstarter, type in Poppy, nice and easy, P O W P I, or you can go to Heggs um, and type it in there, and you'll see it. Press it if you could just buy one. All we need it's one hundred and five thousand dollars. It sounds like a lot, but the item itself is obviously at a higher value. So if you can just buy one, as soon as we hit that threshold. It's going to happen. You are going to be the very first people to get a poppy before any retailer around the world. And then obviously it'll go to retail later on at some point in time when we can get it to there. But go on to there, buy one poppy. And if you could do that, it'll come to fruition and you'll see another great Aussie innovation come to life worldwide. Scott Bucock from Heggs Australia. Thanks for introducing us to Poppy. Congratulations on the idea. Best of luck and thanks for joining us on the in show. Appreciate it. Thanks very much. Next week on The In Show. We're going to hear more from the world of innovation and Claire will have some incredible ideas being developed from all corners of the globe. Don't forget to resubscribe to The In Show on iTunes, the new feed with the coloured logo. And listen to the podcast. You can rate us five stars if you're enjoying hearing what you're hearing. And, of course, we're online as well, theinshow.online. Well, Troy, this show never ceases to amaze me with the amount of incredible stories we're hearing and and these people doing such incredible things. I mean, gee, Susan's story. I mean, the, the impact that she's having, not only from a local perspective, but, you know, right across these regional and remote communities in Australia is just nothing short of extraordinary to me. And I like that we can be talking about remote Australia and then next thing talking about your laundry. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's really diverse, isn't it? We're learning so much. Now, before we go, here's Robin Freeth from TEDx Adelaide, and he's talking about the value of giving back and contributing to a community through volunteering. I do a bit of mentoring around the place and, uh, and one of the consistent bits of advice I give is, is go volunteer for something. You know, we all live in communities and we all take out of community and I think it's really important we put back into a community as well. And volunteering is just a wonderful way of getting engaged with something you care about. You don't have to volunteer, you volunteer because you want to make a difference. And I think that if I look around Adelaide there are so many wonderful volunteering organisations that make such a difference to the community around them that I think if you have the opportunity and the design, the skill set to go and volunteer, you'll be rewarded tenfold on the back of it. The In Show, presented by David Grice and Troy Sincock. News by Shannon Corvo and Claire Murphy. Music by Zach Grice. Produced by Jason Walker. Subscribe to the In Show podcast on iTunes. A Dave and the Beanstalk production. Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to oscastnetwork.com for details.